Thank you so much. Um, and um, thank you for having me. Uh, it's been a while since I gave uh, a talk in person, so that's uh, it's called it's going to go well. Um, yeah, so um, I wasn't sure exactly what to talk about, so I, I just wanted to do like a set of issues that I think are still open problems with deep learning. And um, it's it, the, the whole talk is mostly meant to be uh, motivational. Um, and I throw in some of my, my recent work. But yeah, if you, if you have questions about any of this, uh, feel free to ping me. Uh, you can directly ping me by email or after the talk. And um, yeah, um, feel free to ask questions throughout the talk or you can, you can wait for the end. Um, okay, I already did the outlook. So, so this is kind of the idea. Uh, maybe uh, there are two themes that I'm going to focus on. So one is around um, inductive biases and the other one is uh, around the importance of adaptation. The previous time I gave a similar talk, I actually did not end up covering the second theme because I moved too slow. So let's see how fast we can go through the slides. But if we don't get to it, that's totally fine. Um, and obviously, um, everything that I'm going to talk about it's the outcome of a lot of people, colleagues, and friends that, that helped me um, um, end up with these conclusions. OK, so the first thing I wanted to talk about was adaptability. So I guess, um, yeah, I, I, for, you know, in, in deep learning, for a long time, we've been used to staring at graphs like this one. That basically what they're doing is they're looking at the performance of a system. Um, and yeah, this is sort of the main thing we keep focusing on, right? So we, we like, you know, you have graphs like this that talks about, like, what was the performance, I think this was on, um, was it on speech, I think, from MSR. And, you know, and they look over the years or, you know, um, oh, I don't have the ImageNet one. Oh, this was the ImageNet one, right? This is the performance on ImageNet over the years and stuff like that. So they, the, only, the only one number that we seem to optimize is performance. Um, and there are really good reasons why we care so much about performance. One, one simple reason is that it has a lot of practical implication, right? So if I have a train system that I might want to make into a product or, you know, have other people interact with it, I do care about how well it performs. I do care how well it can predict what it's meant to predict. Um, the other thing why I think we're focusing so much on it is for convenience. Uh, so performance is a really nice metric. It makes it really easy for us to set up benchmarks. and to a big extent, the way the field moved forward was always someone proposed some interesting benchmark, and then everyone, you know, with a hammer, kept hitting on that benchmark, trying to get a 0.5 better or 0.1 better, uh, whatever the metric is. But of course, uh, the issue is that, uh, sorry, was there a question? No. Uh, okay. The, the issue is that um, if we just focus on performance, this gives you a very simplistic view. Um, over what we actually care about the systems. Um, and, and there's like multiple reasons I could come up with more. I just put um, four of them that were on top of my mind. So one of them is, um, and that's because I like continual learning, it, it has to do with the environment. So every time we have a system that we want to interact with the world, the world keeps changing and sometimes in unpredictable ways. Um, and that can be problematic. You know, you, this fixed system cannot deal with that continuous change. Another thing is, um, Focusing on performance, we tend to think a lot about one-size-fits-all kind of solutions. And, and sort of the whole trend with the, this large language models and so forth, it's really in this category, right? Where we're trying to build this huge system that's able to do everything. And, and of course, um, that can be suboptimal. Um, you know, not always one-size-fits-all is the right approach to, to solve all problems. Um, maybe a bit more controversial and more interesting, I do think that performance or whatever we understand by performance is actually, is actually not well defined in general. So when you have a very sanitized scenario where you have a trained test set and things are easy and you can, you, you know, you can set up sort of your metric and you can say this is what you're trying to beat, but in general, this has become harder and harder to do as we move to more realistic data and as we scale things up. So if we're talking again about language, it becomes really hard to talk about test train contamination. What does it mean for two data points to have some overlapping information? How much information is in a given data point? You know, how, what is the distance between data points? Like we don't really know how to do any of that. Um, and the last point is when we focus on performance, we end up stuck in this sort of loop of scaling things up, which is sort of the main thing a lot of people are doing. 
um, where data is not the only bottleneck, right? We have compute bottlenecks and, and so forth. Um, and I guess sort of uh, the argument that I'm trying to make here is that um, we might want to switch from this. And the question is to what? Um, and, and the thing that I'm kind of interested in is to think about um, systems that learn on the fly, systems that can continuously adapt. Um, and the claim is by switching to this, you change a little bit the perspective and that might help you resolve some of these issues that I was talking about. It's not gonna be like a, um, you know, it's not gonna solve all problems. Uh, you still have similar issues even if you switch to this kind of perspective, but you know, the way we've learned in the past is sometimes when you switch perspective, things happen. So, you know, might as well change to, to a different way of looking at things and see, see what happens. Um, and just to go in more detail over why I, you know, why is not good to just focus on performance. So a few points, I kind of made them before, but um, if you think about multitask learning or just sort of learning on lots of data to cover everything that you might care about, uh, then you have issues like you might to reason about coverage. Uh, am I covering all the modes of the distributions that I care about? You know, what are those modes? We don't know. Uh, how do we collect the data? How do we ensure, you know, we're, you, you know, the data is really representative to, of, of what we really want to learn about. Um, and how do we evaluate the system? So I, I talked a little bit about contamination um, and, and things like that. Um, another big theme, at least a couple of years back, was out of distribution generalization. So everyone was excited about it. Out of distribution generalization, you know, it, it was seen as a, as a way of moving forward. So the idea was, well, it doesn't matter whether the data is covering everything because we're gonna have the systems that, dis that generalize to new distributions. Um, and I mean, it kind of makes sense at the same time, it's really hard to, to talk about OD generalization. I find it as a really hard topic to even conceptualize because you have to talk about distributional shifts and I, I don't know what are the right tools to talk about distributional shifts. I mean, there, there are some things that are simple that you can explain in terms of symmetries and so forth, but in general, you don't know what is uh, the relationship between two data that might look similar. Like, you know, for the typical example that people used to do in ImageNet, you have natural images and sketches. But like, what is the mathematical relationship between these two things? We, intuitively, we think they're related, but in what way are related? What is our system supposed to exploit when it's trying to transfer from one to the other? Um, so what does thinking about adaptability do in this kind of settings? Well, it, it changes a little bit the perspective. It, it, like it forces us to think about how quickly a system can track a change in distribution. Um, so now maybe it's a bit easier to talk about um, worst case scenario, best case scenario. Um, maybe we can use tools from optimization to think about this. So it's now we're thinking of this as almost as a convergence problem. Um, we might be able to make some trade-offs a bit more explicit in terms of how much compute you need to gain how much performance or how quickly you extract information out of the data. And kind of just because this was the reason I got thinking about this, I also wanted to uh, highlight this hypothesis that uh, I argued that Thomas Griffiths put forward in this paper. I, I might misinterpret what he meant in that paper, but this is my um, my parsing of the paper. So this is a co cognitive science paper, so it's not really my field. So <laughs> there's always a, a chance that I'm, I'm, I'm reading between the lines. But he talks about this really nice example where he's trying to talk about AlphaGo and you know AlphaGo apparently in one of the games did this move, I forgot what it was, move 47 or whatever. Everyone was perplexed, no one understood the move and supposedly that helped the um, um, agent to beat Lisa Doll in, in that one game. And um, Thomas Griffiths argues that the reason why we can't understand that move or that move doesn't seem you know, meaningful to us is because the way we think about Go is by decomposing it into sub-goals. The way we solve these kind of problems is always constructing these sub-problems, solving them and composing the solutions. And that's not what the agent does. The agent just cares about and, you know, the solution at the end. There is no decomposition of the Go problem in any form for AlphaGo. AlphaGo only cares of the final um, uh, performance. And, and then, um, you know, in the paper he goes on and, and, and says, why do we have to always decompose the problem into sub-problems? Why don't we solve the problem, you know, directly? And, and the reason is because it's not efficient. Um, 
The only way we can learn very efficiently is by using this kind of decomposition and composition of subproblems. Um, and he's arguing that you know, the, the profile of the human intelligence, I think that's kind of the theme of the paper, is defined by its limitations. So we think the way we think, you know, we, we do decomposition, we do all these kind of things, we do all this kind of generalization because we have all of these limitations. Um, and that's, if you take this limitation into account, this is the only solution. Um, and ML systems have limitations as well. They just have different limitations. They, they have different computational budgets and so forth. Um, and I guess sort of connected to, to the theme before, I guess sort of what I took from this paper is that maybe we should not be that afraid of limitations and, and think of them as something, a hurdle that we need to deal with, but actually think of them as part of the solution. So think of limitations as a way of shaping your low surface to make sure that the system learns the right kind of solution. So when we're talking about why doesn't my system learn this kind of combinatorical generalization, it's because it doesn't have to. You know, one way to force a system to maybe learn to, to solve the problems in a co combinatorical way is to limit the amount of compute it can do and everything to, a, to that point that the only solution that it can have is the combinatorical solution. That's kind of the high level view of this. And, and that's why I guess I'm arguing that if we switch to adaptability and sort of speed of learning and speed of extracting information from data, we might learn solutions that have very different profiles and very different properties than the ones that we get when we just focus on performance. And at a high level, I guess sort of what I'm arguing for, and, and this term doesn't make any sense, but I'm arguing that instead of having an objective that just looks at performance, you know, we need to correct for the cost of learning, the cost of inference, the amount of hard-coded information, the inductive devices that we put in, and, and so forth. And obviously, the objective should not look like this. We don't know how the objective should look, and we don't know how to compute any of these things. <laughs> but in an idealized way, that's what we care about. And I also wanted to highlight that when we talk about cost of learning, there's, again, a difference, whereas traditionally everyone has been thinking of it in terms of data efficiency, but there's also computational efficiency. And, and they have, again, they lead to different kinds of solutions. Um, OK. Uh, the other thing I wanted to highlight at the end of this uh, is that while this might change a few things, there's still some problems that we still don't know how to deal with. In particular, I think um, in the community, we many times are kind of trying to avoid talking about relationship between data. Um, and this is something that's becoming more and more important. Um, so the only reason um, we could do this is because we relied hev heavily on the IID assumption. And then, you know, you could have the trained test and you could say the test, you know, th th there is some proof there that says that the test is significant, it makes some sense. But when you lose this non-IID assumption, um, I think talking about relationship between uh, data distribution, re relationship between data points becomes very important. Um, and I think we have some tools. Um, you know, we can talk about symmetries and invariances in the data. We can talk about causal structure. And for example, Joshua Benjo is very big on this. And if you look carefully at his work or if you have a chance to talk to him, you realize that he cares about causality spe specifically because of this as well. Because for him, causality is a way of formalizing continual learning. So you can't really do continual learning. Like, you can't really talk about train task A and then on task B without saying what's the relationship between A and B. And for him, the relationship between A and B is some change in the causal graph. Um, another thing is we can go back to um, probabilities or distributions and stuff like that and talk about diver divergences. I don't think there's anything there that makes me think that's a way out. But, you know. Um, this is a very rich field, and there's lots of stuff there, so it's worth looking at it again. Um, a, a, diff, a new direction that I found quite uh, exciting, and I've been spending a little bit of time trying to, to track, and it seems to gain a lot of momentum, is to use category theory for those who really, likes math, who really like math, um, to talk about algorithmic alignment. So, you know, if you want to describe two generating processes, you kind of look at the computational graph of these processes, um, and you try to abstract this away using category theory, and then you try to argue, like, what's the mapping between them and how different these computational graphs are. Um, but of course, we don't know if these tools are enough. There are probably others that I haven't listed. Um, we don't really, we believe they're very connected to each other. I don't know of a paper that really connects all of them together and shows that, you know, they're just different ways of saying the same thing. 
Um, and I don't think it's such a big topic at the moment in the field, and I wish it was bigger, and I wish you know, people would, would work more on these kind of things. Um, OK, so now I wanted to jump into continual learning. So the reason we care about continual learning, based on the motivation that I've made so far, is because continual learning is really trying to ask this question, right? How can you continuously learn? How can you learn on the fly in an efficient way by building on what you've learned so far? And um, this is kind of the typical definition you see of continual learning in the field. This is actually from a, a paper from, from Raya, myself, um, uh, Andre, and Dushan. Um, and usually continual learning is, is given as a list of desiderata of what you want from a system, right? So you want the system to learn, you know, even if the data distribution changes. Um, but you want to do it in such a way that uh, it maintains plasticity, so it can still learn the new things that it sees. It maximizes forward and backwards transfer, so it can use the data. Um, it, it has it minimizes forgetting, so you know you're dealing with catastrophic forgetting in there, um, and you're not exploding in terms of capacity on computation in order to incorporate this new data. So this is very like a, a very descriptive way of describing continual learning, but. I think what happens in practice is when people start working on continual learning, um, they find that there's many flavors of it, right? Um, I'd actually argue that there's no continual learning problem. There's like a family of problems. None of them is more important than the other. Um, and, and therefore, it almost feels like from this definition, something is missing, right? <laughs> With like the motivation of why you do this, like to, to kind of pinpoint each of this flavor, give it its sort of own scope and, and, and so forth. Um, and, and furthermore, it's not just the definition is not sufficient, it's also like it, it also creates contradictions. So we know that there are different ones in that list that cannot you cannot satisfy jointly, right? You can't have perfect recall, but have a fixed size model. Um, for transfer seems to be in, um, at least in practice, seems to be directly uh, opposite to um, uh, forgetting. Um, you have, um, you know, you have all of these compelling, uh, um, uh, competing needs, and also, like, de depending on the the task that you use, depending on the benchmark, some of these problems are more visible than others. So, if, for example, a typical benchmark that people use in the field for a long time is permitted MNIST, where you just take uh, the MNIST data set and you permit the pixels, um, it's a bit hard to talk about forward transfer there because what you're doing is you're destroying all the structure in the image. So. Obviously, if you have a system that doesn't know how to do forward transfer, that's not the right benchmark to measure that, right? You you would not see that um, um, happening there. So continual learning is, is not really a problem. It's, it's sort of this mix of, of many possible problems. And um, people have started trying to kind of sketch the different types of continual learning problems. I don't think any of those sketches is complete. Um, and they're focusing on maybe on, on certain as aspects I would not uh, focus on, and there's just something missing that I think would help kind of um, formalize a little bit the concept. And what I'm trying to give here is like examples of reasons we might care about continual learning, um, and, and then for those reasons, hopefully, we'll try to motivate different aspects of the question and why they're important. So, one example of how you can ground continual learning and make it practical and make sure that you understand whether you're making progress or not is to think of real problems. And for example, at this workshop in 2021, they've introduced, they've introduced what they call continuous semi-supervised learning. And the thing that I like most about it, it was really a very pragmatic problem. So what they're arguing is that, well, we have this system that we want to deploy that interacts with the world. We've trained it, we've collected lots of data, we've trained it with labels. As soon as we deployed it, because of the interactions, the distribution changes. But the problem that they're having is that they do not want to relabel data. So it's easy for them to collect data as the system interacts with the world, but labeling is expensive and it's hard. So their question is, can we somehow incorporate the data you know, without labeling it? And that's why they call it semi-supervised. And the nice thing about it is because, well, you, you kind of have a good sense of where this is going to be applied, what kind of data you need to, because it has a very practical application. And you know, basically, one, one way of grounding continual learning is pick a real problem, say, especially if you are in the uh, applied <laughs> industry. You know, pick a problem that, that, that your company has, and you know, look exactly at what kind of data distributional drifts they have there, what kind of uh, issues they have. And 
that becomes your continual learning problem. Another way is to focus on, on RL. And for a lot of people, um, they even think that continual learning only makes sense in RL. So I know Rich Sutton said this a few times. I, I don't agree with him. But in RL, the, the, the thing is because the data that you see depends on the actions that you take, you implicitly have this non-stationary stream of data, right? So there's no way around it. And implicitly, if we look at DeepRL and what people have done in the practice, even the first you know, system of DeepRL that worked well, DQN, had to deal with this problem. And the way it did with this was the replay buffer, where the replay buffer was trying to make the data stationary for the function approximator. So as soon as you mix RL with function approximators, you have to deal with the continual learning problem. Um, and so far, I think, if you look at the RL community, many times the way they deal with this is by brute force. So you have the replay buffer for DQN. It, it does other things, but it also helps with the stationarity of the, of the data. You have the League of Experts in StarCraft. So in order to get StarCraft off the ground, you need to have this League of Experts that you need to play with. That's what it does. It deals with catastrophic forgetting. In, in AlphaGo, we had the same thing. So when you do self-play, you had to keep track of multiple previous copies of, of, of the Go agent, and you have to randomly sample among them and play with them. So that th those are like brute force, like rehearsal techniques to deal with issues in continual learning. Um, Multi-agent, again, is sort of like a special. Um, so what I like about multi-agent compared to RL is that it, it, like it's easier to, to uh, figure out what the tasks are. Um, and obviously, one question that you can ask is, well, replay seems to work. You know, people are happy, but can we do better? Can we do something that's cheaper? Can we do something that works better? Um, like I can tell you that sort of the, the League of Experts can become very expensive, right? <laughs> like you have to play lots of, you, you have to go through a lot of games in order for these things to work. So can you, can you reduce that in some sense? And, and then that sort of becomes a very specific continual learning problem that you can work on. Um, just because I wanted to throw in some of the works, um, I wanted to highlight two papers that I uh, published, that I was involved recently. So these are mostly works from uh, Maciej uh, and Mikal. So these are uh, colleagues in, in Poland, actually, that I worked with. Um, and the first paper, we were wondering about the question of forward transfer and what does it mean in RL. Um, and one thing that we found that I think is kind of interesting is um, we created this benchmark, Continual World, that was focusing on measuring forward transfer. And we found that all, almost all continual learning systems, they explicitly trade uh, forward transfer for catastrophic forgetting. So if you take any traditional system that is trying to prevent catastrophic forgetting, that explicitly reduces the amount of forward transfer. And you know, our argument is that um, that's not really what we wanted. So when we started doing continual learning, the, the hypothesis was you need to accumulate knowledge over the things you see so that you can exploit that knowledge to learn faster. And we always thought, okay, the first step in this process is to accumulate knowledge. So you deal with catastrophic forgetting in order to accumulate knowledge. But it seems that you can't sequentialize these steps this way. You can't first fix the knowledge acquisition part and then say, OK, I'll figure out how to use the knowledge later. It feels like as soon as you start acquiring knowledge, you're paying a big price in terms of how quickly you learn new things. So you can't separate the problems. You need to deal with them at the same time. Um, and, and there's other interesting things that I find about this paper. So another interesting thing is that, um, which I find that, well, more paper, lots of other people are doing this now, but I find that uh, it's compared to catastrophic forgetting when it's forward transfer, it's very frustrating not to have an upper bound. It's really hard to say, well, I have this sequence of tasks. My goal is to maximize forward transfer, but you don't know how much is there to maximize. Like, what is the goal of your system? You know, if you just run something, is that already doing optimally? Is there any room for improvement? And what's the room for improvement? And here we came up with a heuristic of defining some sort of an upper bound. Um, and on the second paper, this plot maybe don't mean anything to you. That's OK. Um, there is one cute thing that we found in this paper, which is we are trying to understand what is different between RL and supervised learning. And one thing, maybe not surprisingly, but anyway, one thing that is different is that, at least in continual world, um, transferring features doesn't help you. So a lot of the supervised learning, the whole focus is how can I transfer the features I've learned on task one and reuse them when I do task two. It turned out here that if we look at the four transfer that we typically observe in these systems, you can explain, I forgot, 80% of it or something like that by just using the previous policy to fill up the replay buffer. 
So just by controlling the quality of the data and reinitializing the actor, the critic, everything. So it seems that you know the traditional feature transfers are not potentially sometimes are not as important in RL, and there's other aspects of continual learning that you would probably not focus on if you do. I don't know, split CIFAR or whatever in, in supervised learning. So this paper was basically just trying to go over a list of um, things that are different in RL that you cannot emulate in supervised learning and trying to, to pin down that. Um, another thing about, um, another way to think about continual learning that I think it's exciting is this idea that if you think of continual learning as a system that is, is like a, a, as this adaptability and how quickly things adapt, um, and, and you think a more about it, and for example, you think what that means for OD generalization, well, in OD generalization, doesn't make sense anymore, right? Because there is no distribution, like your system always learned. But what your problem becomes, it becomes a tracking problem. So the way you can think of continual learning, or the way you can think of this is you just have a system uh, where you're trying to track, uh, so instead of trying to converge to some point, you're trying to track this target that keeps moving. Um, and I think this is interesting because um, it might mean that a lot of things that we're doing from an optimization perspective, it's completely wrong, right? If the goal of your system is to never converge, but actually just to track, uh, then you know, some of the optimizers we have, they might be too aggressive uh, because you know, implicitly they're trying to converge. And particularly, like one side effect of this is, I, I think Rich Sutton is a big, uh, so this is Rich work with, with his students, uh, but really the first work that started talking about this, at least that I know of, is Jordan Ash and Ryan Adams. Um, they talk about this loss of plasticity. So it does turn out that as you train on some data, when you try to fine tune on the next data, you're not learning as well. And, and there are actually two variants of this loss of plasticity. So in one variant, which is sort of the, the thing that Jordan Ash and Ryan Adams focus on mostly, is the, this idea that you don't generalize as well. So this is the typical plot. So this is not uh, their plot. It's our plot where we redone sort of their experiments. But the point here is you train on half of CIFAR, and then after that, you fine tune on the full CIFAR system. And what you see is that you cannot obtain the same generalization. So your system pays a price because it was pre-trained on half of the data, even if that data is from the same distribution I dissembled. Um, so there is this generalization gap that you have to, to pay. Um, and it's not, it's, it has nothing to do with the optimizer. So if you look at the training error, the training error goes down. Like you, you can go to the same level of errors before. It's really about generalization. And it's potentially you know, connected to things like this is the work from, from Google Fox that talk about um, like how you can play a little bit of the initialization and you get the systems that have zero training error but chance in terms of test accuracy. So it's all about the inductive biases that initialization give you. So think about Belkin's work and double descent and sort of, um, you know, all of these things uh, play a role. So what it means is that when we fine tune a system, well, we're potentially starting from, from a point that doesn't have the same kind of properties that you typically have. Just looking at the time. Okay. Need to. And if you guys have questions, just, just feel, feel free to ask. Um, so, so this is sort of a problem that's um, um, maybe, uh, you know, maybe it's not as big as we think, but maybe it's big. Uh, the Re Reach Sutton's work mostly focuses on the lack of optimization. So what happens is you can, if you train the system, depending on how you train them, when you try to fine tune them, you can find out that you cannot minimize the training error because the curvature explodes or all this kind of like weird phenomena that happen from training. And, and this is sort of part of, you know, if we only care about a fixed, you know, one task, we don't care about these things, right? <laughs> because we've converged, that's it. But this is all coming from the target, from the fact that you have this tracking problem. And then what you really care about is having this plasticity, this ability to keep learning at any point in time. Uh, I'm gonna skip over that slide. Um, the other thing, the other way to think about continual learning that I find fascinating and sort of, this is what I want, I, I didn't get to do much in this space, but this is really what I wanted to do at least a couple of years ago, um, is this idea of thinking of continual learning from the uh, perspective of credit assignment in neural networks. So if I think of how gradient descent works, so you have a batch of examples. When you're computing the gradient, applying a gradient step, so think of pure gradient descent now. Um, what you're doing is for each weight, you're asking the, independently the question, if I'm increasing this weight, would my loss go down? You know, should I increase it or should I decrease it? And you ask this question for every weight in parallel. And then 
you ask this question for every example in your batch, and then you're averaging over these things. In particular, when you average over the batch, you have these votes that every example has, you know, increase, increase, decrease, increase. <laughs> and when you average them, it's almost like playing this tug of war game, right? Each example is pulling on the weight, trying to increase it or decrease it. And that's sort of how learning works, right? And learning, like you converge when you find like an equilibrium between these forces. Like each example exerts a force on your weight and you know, at some point you'd find the equilibrium. And if you look at this kind of tug of war game, if, if learning really happens through this tug of war games, what that means is, well, that is the reason you need ID data because you need everyone pulling on the rope. Like if I would remove this guy, obviously the game doesn't make sense. You just pull the rope all the way to your side. So the only way the game works is if you really have all the forces in there and ID ensures that. And the other thing that this says is that there's no explicit knowledge composition. The way you learn knowledge is by contrasting it at the same time, all the different things that you're trying to learn. There's no like, you know, you learn this in relation to that and you kind of build on the knowledge that you have. Um, so if you're thinking from, and, and, and obviously this is also the reason for catastrophic forgetting. So if you're thinking about just solving catastrophic forgetting from this perspective, what you're saying is what you really want to do is to find another way to do credit assignment in learning. And I know credit assignment means something in RL, and here what I mean is which weights get to be blamed for the loss. Like how do you, basically gradient descent tries to do that, right? Tries to assign blame to the weights. And the question is can we do better? <laughs> um, and, and if you think about this, then, you know, continuous learning, it's really something about the learning dynamics and it's something about the optimizer itself. Um, and it also kind of suggests, for example, why some people don't like rehearsal-based methods for continuous learning. It's because they're bas not trying to answer this question, right? They're, they're, they're ignoring this question. They're just sidestepping it. So if you really care about changing how you do create assignment, rehearsal is not, it's a dead end. You're not starting there. You want to do something completely different. Um, and uh, with Tom Scholl, we had this paper, it's quite a bit ago, but it's still probably one of my favorite works. Uh, it's mostly Tom, but anyway. Um, where we were looking at how this, this interference happens, and, and it's quite interesting. So I, I'm, I'm not going to go into details. It's, it's a cool paper. It's, uh, it's a very, like, yeah, high-level paper of sorts. Um, and, and similar results. So this is RL-specific. Similar results Andrew Sachs actually had before us, uh, but we didn't fully understand what he was doing there. I mean, I, 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 looking back from after I did the work with Tom, I, I see Andrew's paper in a very different way. Uh, but the result, what we did here is we were doing multitask learning, and we were trying to understand how we were learning the different tasks. And it turns out that because of interference and because of this tug of war dynamics, what happens is you start to learn one task, and that task prevents you from learning the other ones. So the interesting bit about this work that I found is that uh, even when you do multitask learning, if you actually check the performance of your task, you're learning them sequentially in the way you'd learn them as a person as well. And usually there's some biases where you know you learn first the easier task and then the harder tasks. Or but even if you have tasks tasks that are equally complex, you still kind of learn them in sequence. And I find this quite interesting and surprising because it says that um, you know multitask learning doesn't work. <laughs> The system still learns things sequentially. It's just that we don't know how to do the learning them sequentially. If we really provide the task sequentially, nothing would work. We need to provide all of them. And, and then what that means is that we're actually wasting a lot of compute. So because we still learn the task sequentially, when I learn task A, I'm spending a lot of compute looking at all the other tasks or all the other modes of the data. So this could be a source of why deep learning is so, da is so computationally inefficient. Because it doesn't know how to do sequential learning, right? So whenever you learn in, in deep, uh, with a deep learning system, you're w actually wasting a lot of compute that it's only there to create some of these forces. I mean, you're not wasting it. It has a purpose. It's to, to play this type of word game. But you, it, it just feels wasteful in the sense that you're not making any progress on learning how to play with Protoss when you're learning how to play with Zerg. But you still have to play episodes with, with Protoss, just, you know, so that at the end, you could play with both races, right? Um, ideally, what you do is you just play with Zerg. <laughs> After you've learned that, you go and play with Protoss, and that would be way more data efficient. So just a kind of a sum summary and thoughts about this first part of the talk. And I might even stop here, because I took a long time. But uh, learning on the fly, I find it a very kind of interesting new perspective uh, to think about learning in general. and. 
I believe that it might change the perspective. I still, you know, I might be, end up being proven wrong, but I think it's an interesting way to think about how efficiently am I extracting knowledge from the data and, and try to maximize that and trying to see what kind of solutions you end up if you do that. I like the idea of trying to use limitations to shape the loss surface. I, I think that's an interesting uh, way of thinking of the problem. Um, continual learning uh, is potentially the subfield of machine learning that is trying to do some of this. Um, but overall, it's underspecified, ill-defined. Um, you know, people are not happy with any of the benchmarks that we have. We keep proposing benchmarks. No one likes them. Um, there's a lot of back and forth, so the field is not super mature, but it might end up there. And, you know, trying to think of this kind of stuff might help us ground a little bit better what we want to do when we do this continual learning. So I'm going to stop here for a second to see if we have questions. I'm, it's 45 according to my watch, so I'm almost... At the end, I still have some slides I could go over, but yeah, just a second to see if anyone has any questions on the first part. Yeah? Could you say that? Yes, indeed. Um, I mean, in some sense, that's where, well, it depends what you mean. OK, so there, there are different aspects for it. For the simplest example I can think of, which is very sanitized, is you, you have like a arm, a robotic arm, and it learns some kind of safety protocols. And you start learning, and you don't want it to forget those safety protocols, right? You don't want the arm suddenly to go through the, through the table and break the arm and so forth. And that's sort of, I guess, the goal of catastrophic forgetting and all of this stuff. Like you, you want to make, the other thing you can think about is sort of things like fairness or um, you know, like a, a chatbot that becomes toxic. I think that becomes a little bit hard, and, and there's something different that has nothing to do with forgetting, that just have, has something to do with the quality of the data. Um, I don't think, yeah, it, it, might, it, it definitely makes it a little bit more problematic, because at least if you have a, a fixed system, you can train it, you can test it somehow, you can assume it's safe enough, and you can deploy it while you learn, like you don't know, maybe someone will hack it. But I, I think that problem is there no matter what. Uh, but it's definitely, yeah, the, I, I think you're right. It's, it's definitely an open. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So there, 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 there are a lot of, of, of issues and and I think it has to do with the kind of data distributions and stuff like that so uh, for ex and, and, and for us not agreeing what we care about so for example traditionally in the early years of continual learning the only thing we used to focus on is catastrophic forgetting and th the reason for that is because well we thought it's the first step it's easy to quantify it's easy to measure but then it turns out that it might not be what we care about so when I'm deploying a system catastrophic forgetting not it's not that interesting if I pay a huge loss when it comes to learning new things. So people now are trying to, to redefine. And then because these things, you seem to be trading them, like we don't know what is the ratio we care about. Like how much, you know, how much uh, forgetting should I allow for how much? And, and, and the other thing is, like when you're looking at this kind of uh, trade-offs, they depend on the benchmark that you run because it depends on the you know, how much is there to transfer from one task to another? Like, what is the common structure, right? So you can do split C5, split image net. Those are not going to be very indicative of what happens maybe to more interesting problems that you care about. Uh, so I think that's kind of the issue, right? It's like, if you don't have something, that, like, okay, so you could have applications that guide you, but then no one has access to the data. They may be too large scale and so forth. Or you can make benchmarks like split C5, uh, split image net, whatever they have nowadays. Um, and then... Those are like some, those data sets would impose some kind of arbitrary trade-offs that you might not care about. And then you might end up, you, well, you kind of end up in this kind of weird situation where like, okay, this method works better on split image net, that method works better on this benchmark. Like, which is the better method? Well, we don't know because we don't know what to hear about and we don't know what those benchmarks are. Uh, so this is kind of the argument. Now people are, 
making all of these benchmarks where I think the, the word that everyone likes to use is natural. It's like this is a more natural transition of data. But the issue is we don't know what natural means, right? So like for someone that might look, so like one data set that I really liked was clear. So what they did is they tracked uh, images of objects as they evolved through time. So imagine a phone from the 80s until now and you're supposed to be always be able to classify this is a phone even though the aspect of phone. I mean, and then they argue that is natural. I mean, obviously it's natural in some sense, but for some other people that might not really be what they want when they say natural. So, so I think this is kind of. Yes? Yeah. Yeah. But if you wanted to build a system like AGI yeah. that was closer to humans, yeah. would you then try do the sub goals system or would you just Well, uh, yeah, I mean I, it's like it's a loaded question. So first of all, like do we want to build a, an AGI system that thinks like humans? We don't know. I mean we might because then it's easier to interpret. Otherwise, we might not be able to interpret it. But otherwise, there's no real reason, right? Intelligence doesn't need to look like. Um, I think, like with the sub goal stuff, to me, the question is why do we do the sub goals? And, and, and we do the sub goals because we're very efficient. Like, I mean, human learning, it's way more efficient than anything else, right? Um, so if it turns out that efficiency, and a lot of people would argue that that is true, particularly people from cognitive science, efficiency is tied to this kind of compositional generalization, then you want it because that's the only way you can have a system that learns really fast. So it's not that we want it to be like humans, we do care about systems that are able to very quickly learn new things. And it turns, well, a lot of people are arguing the only way to do that is through this kind of compositional generalization. That's the only way you can yeah, approach the problem. Questions? Okay. I see. I have a few more minutes. I can go through more slides. Maybe people have. The other slides are a little bit more specific. So these are just kind of examples of papers. So maybe here people will have questions because it's a bit more explicit. So um, it was about biases. And I find, well, I don't know. But like a few years back, if you talk to people working in deep learning, you know, there was this obsession that you need to let the data speak, right? Don't put anything in the system, learn everything from the data. And I guess what I wanted to argue here is that, well, actually we're putting a lot, <laughs> quite a lot in the systems. We just don't know what we're putting. There are all these implicit biases we don't understand. The better we understand them, the better we do in understanding what we're doing. And the other thing is we have to put explicit biases. And then the question is we actually don't know how to put explicit biases in the, in, in, in the learning system. And I just wanted to talk about ways of doing that. I just wanted to talk about implicit biases. So for example, for continual learning, this is one problem. Uh, so there was this big dispute. So okay, so I'm kind of jumping, assuming you know, you guys know a little bit about continual learning, but there's these two family of approaches. One of them is based on rehearsal, so you just replay data from the previous tasks. The other one is you construct this kind of regularization term that helps you remember the task. And it's always been argued that rehearsal methods have to be way better and the reason for that is because these regularization terms, they always rely on basically taking a second tailor. They, 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 they rely on like a Bayesian interpretation, so it's about sort of learning your posterior, but always that posterior is a Gaussian. So it's equivalent to taking a second order tailor expansion of your loss and, and approximating your loss with that. So obviously people are saying like, look, because of that, regularization will always fail because you, you're, you're making this very crude approximation of what you're trying to learn. And in this year, what we showed, what we found surprisingly, is that if we look at the solutions that you find with rehearsal that have this ability to jump over modes or whatnot, it actually turns out that they don't do that. <laughs> All the solutions you get with rehearsal, they tend to be within the area where the second order um, approximation holds. And now you can interpret these results in many ways. But one way to interpret it is this is an inductive bias that is coming from size. So because implicitly, whenever we start doing deep learning, we use this over parameterized systems, it turns out that the right thing to do for continual learning is to stay within this region. Um, and this kind of raises all kinds of questions, like what happens when we're under parameterized? Would learning even work? Anyway, but it was sort of just highlighting that actually, you know, we made all of these strong assumptions that, uh, but, but it turns out that actually, 
even if we do this kind of rehearsal based replay where we cheated as much as we could, you know, you had all the data, everything, like your, um, your solutions were always in an area where um, the second order approximation holds. Basically, all, all this is does is just follows the direction of very low curvature, which is what the regularization base was trying to do. The other thing that we found is a lot of work in continual learning, again, is focusing on all kinds of fancy algorithms. We look to see what's the effect of size of the model. And it turns out that the size of the model has a huge impact on equal to all the different algorithms on how much you forget. So if you are you know, comparing two things, like you need to make sure that you have the same capacity. Um, and yeah, we just found it kind of impressive that scale alone has such a huge impact on how well uh, the, the, the system forgets. Um, and we also tried different kind of architectures and we actually found that um, the architecture choice makes a huge difference. In particular, ResNets are horrible in the sense that ResNets are the ones that forget very aggressively. So for example, if you do something like, I think, split image net, or I forgot what we did here, um, and you use a CNN, a traditional CNN, think of like all very AlexNet and old school stuff like that, you actually end up performing better overall. So this is the blue line. And then if you use ResNet or any new architectures, because those architectures um, yeah, amplify the forgetting incredibly. Um, and, and we've been using ResNet for like random reasons, just because it's the default, right? You're doing a vision task, you have to use a ResNet. But you know, this is just kind of arguing that all of these architectures have a huge impact, and all of these impacts is sort of on the same order of magnitude as going from not doing anything to doing EWC or doing rehearsal with some small replay buffer and all of this stuff. So the gap are huge. The amount of change that only scale or architecture choice has is big. And it's something that in the field we typically ignored completely. Like in the field, no one really looked at this, right? Uh, and sometimes maybe even compared between architectures in a very unfair way. Uh, so this is, uh, the other thing that I wanted to highlight is, uh, I, I mean, this is not necessarily my work, but you know, like I think um, the other thing we know is that initialization plays a huge role. Um, and, and like I think, you know, Belkin's, I, I think the way, well, at least the way I've heard uh, the double descent being explained, usually it's, it's sort of through, I, I think maybe even Belkin said this in the paper, but through this idea that scale acts as a regularizer. So you can think of it as L2, prefer small norm solution, Occam's razor, blah, blah, blah. That's why it makes sense. So the bigger you make the model, you end up with this strong kind of regularizer to small norm solution. So Occam's razor generalizes better. Everything is, 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 uh, working. The way I like to think of it is slightly different, which is as you over parameterize, you end up having many, many solutions with zero training error. So when you're in this typical regime that we are used to, you only have one solution that has zero training error because you're under parameterized. When you over parameterize, you have many, many, many solutions and number of solutions explodes, right? Because you, you and, and then what happens is what happens in a more modern <laughs> interpolation regime is that then you converge to the closest solution to initialization. And what that means is that you, you end up with a system from which th that is still dependent on initial conditions, right? <laughs> so you have a system that from which, from the solution, from theta star, you can trace back theta zero. Because it's not anymore, so like the solutions that you found, it doesn't only depend on data, but actually depends on initialization and it depends heavily. Um, and um, there's, um, Examples like the work from Google that I mentioned before where, you know, you play with the initialization a little bit and you get the systems that converge that generalize randomly. Uh, we had this, uh, this was done around Christmas. Um, we had this work with Ocek where basically what we showed is you take an image, whatever image you want, you take the image of the, of the Christmas tree and you can even theoretically show that you can find some part in the lost surface that looks like that image. Um, so the lost surface is arbitrarily complex. So if you, if you just look over the entire domain, Basically, the lost surface can have any structure you want. It can be arbitrarily complicated and stuff. And uh, we, we, here we have, like, this is actually a theoretical result where we show you can build these things. But of course, this happens somewhere far away from utilization. So that's why we don't care. Um, and then the question is, what is, and then, like, there's also results that show that the reason why ResNet works is connected to this and sort of the relation. So this is Soham and Sam. Um, 
work from 2020 that uh, led to the NFNet architecture. And there, basically, the understanding is that the reason why ResNet work so well is because you need the skip connection in order to make the installation work. If you don't have the skip connections, basically, the gradients are misbehaved because we don't know how to initialize very deep conf nets. So the, the skip connection is kind of like a, a trick to change sort of how the gradients flow in the system. Um, I'm sure if there's any question. Um, you know, in the same, same vein, you know, people for a long time has always thought like, why does stochastic gradient descent work better than gradient descent? Typical answer was the flat, sharp, minima kind of thing, which I still think makes a lot of sense though nobody, I think, well, I don't know of any formalism that I really like, but you know, it's sort of, this is old thing from Jurgen. But then nowadays it turns out that actually, if you look at HGD, there is an implicit bias. So it's not just the noise. It's not just noise that helps escape sharp minima, but you actually end up converging to a different point because the objective you're actually optimizing when you're doing HGD is the original objective plus this regularizer, which is you're regularizing the norm of the gradients. And there's a, a theoretical way to show this. And then if you do full batch versus mini batch versus different things, you get different regularizers. So I think it's kind of becoming more and more clear that the choices we have, you know, they, they have, there are explicit biases that change the point or where we converge. Um, and the other result that I found kind of interesting, this is Stan's internship, is we're looking at, you know, noise used to, everyone was making such a big thing of the noise in gradient descent, and we're trying to understand the different sources of noise. And it turns out that if you look at the noise from data augmentation, that's actually very hurtful. So we're trying to compare the noise from sampling different examples in your batch versus uh, the noise that comes from data augmentation. And it turns out that the noise from data augmentation is very hurtful, so you actually want to average over gradients over many data augmentations to reduce that noise as much as you can. So you only care about the bias that comes from the data augmentation, but not of the noise. When it comes for different data points from your data set, then you want to maximize that noise because that noise is very useful. And Again, so like the type of noise is very important, but we don't understand what is the profile of this noise. Like people have tried, you know, playing with Gaussian noise to help HGD, and that doesn't work. It doesn't do anything. So there is a particular kind of noise that is very useful, and uh, um, yeah, it's it seems data augmentation is not that, which I find kind of interesting. What else did I? Uh, this is another work that I found. Uh, that we did recently, which is another way to think about it is um, if you understand how the system works, you can always, because if you have relative systems, you can always go to the typical perspective on this as a piecewise linear function. And then you can ask, how is my data distributed over how I'm partitioning the space? And it turns out that from this, you can come up with a metric that helps you understand uncertainty and generalization, which is pretty cool. But it also tells you that actually, you know, the way you split the space plays a huge role. So another way of interpreting this is, like the solution that we have, a big part of it is this random partitioning of the space plus whatever you can do to these linear pieces. So you're trying to like rotate them and change them around. But a big role plays sort of how this uh, space is being partitioned. And the way the space is being partitioned is through the initialization, right? So then the question is like, if you think about different initialization, how are those initialization distributing these linear pieces over to the space? You know, are they concentrating them around zero? Are they spherical? Are they shaped? I, I, I just found this sort of like a very intriguing way of thinking of this problem. And um, I, th there's no results in this paper about that, but I think that would be a very exciting sort of future direction in trying to understand what is the impact of how you utilize the weights in how you're partitioning the space and how the density of linear region changes over the, over the space. I, I think that would be pretty cool. And, um, yeah, and this is sort of other parts of the, and then on the explicit biases, like we know biases are super important. Like in all what contrastive learning is, is just creating a different language for us to specify biases by hand, by deciding the data augmentation. And there's a lot more in this paper, but in this paper, basically you have relic V1, relic V2, it's a huge gap. And all of this is just changing the data augmentation. <laughs> so playing a little bit of data augmentation can lead to huge gap in performance. So like the role of the biases that we can't underestimate the role of the biases that we're inserting in the systems. Um, There's another work where we're using pre-training again to kind of explicitly introducing a bias in the system. And 
again, it leads to like a huge, uh, like a huge performance. Like I, I forgot, like 25% performance on some molecule data that is sort of like a big deal and everyone is excited about. And all of this is why just basically by pre-training the system, am I trying to? So the inductive bias that we try to do here is you have a GNN, so this is in graph neural networks, and usually initialize them for information to flow if you think of it as a, just a feed-forward system. But in neural network, you also have the messages. So what we're doing here is we're asking the question, can a node send a message to another node, and can it reach it over there? So you add a regularizer that makes sure that if I put some information on node A, I can read it from node B. And that's sort of what this kind of pre-training is trying to do here, and this has a huge improvement. So again, it's another way of doing explicit biases. Um, I'm really going over time, so guys feel free to, to stop me. Sorry. And the other thing that I found cool is like traditionally when we think about inductive biases, we think about adding a term. So this is sort of the usual way. You add the regular, so you have the regularizer, you have your loss surface, you compose these loss surfaces and that changes where you converge. But in this work, uh, we did something pretty funky, which is we changed the loss surface. So basically we didn't change the position of any of the minima. We didn't change sort of, what we changed is the curvature. So what we did is we exploited the, f we, we, we made sure that for any weight, you have a plateau around zero. And then if you do SGD with this, it turns out that you can learn systems that are much better to sparsify. Because you have this inductive bias, you have this thing where the weights get locked at zero. So again, this is kind of like a different way of adding an inductive bias where you're kind of shaping the loss surface, not to eliminate, not to exclude other solutions, but to make the solutions you prefer to be more likely because kind of push them closer to initialization. Okay, I'm really going to stop here because I think I'm over time. I don't know if there's any other questions. Yes. So can, can you repeat the question? I don't think I've heard you well. Do you think the, the fact that the neural network can go so far beyond the assumption Yeah, I mean, it depends on what you care about. I mean, I guess sort of part of the argument that Thomas Griffiths had is that um, for Go, there's no point to decompose the problems, right? I mean, that's why AlphaGo is better than Lisa Doll, because Lisa Doll does not have access to that kind of way of thinking of the game. You know, he cannot think that far in the future or like try to estimate or whatever. You know, he has to decompose the problem into. I mean, AlphaGo does some, some of that as well, right? Because if you'd really want to brute force Go, I mean, that was the whole point. It's two to the power, whatever, more atoms in the universe, no one can do it. Like AlphaGo does some pattern matching. So it does collapse some of the possible, possibili you know, possible states into one, but it doesn't do as much as Lisa at all does. Um, so yeah, you could get different kinds of solutions, obviously, and they could be good for some things. Um, efficient learning is not going to be one of them. That, I guess, is the argument. Now, the question is how much we care about efficiency of learning. Um, I don't know. It depends on the instance. Yeah? So the continuum learning approach, you choose to put like, less weight in a regularization term. So surely, if like directly counteracting like, updates as new data comes in, um, sorry, so you're, you're asking whether like choosing the weighting of the regularizer term can, you can play with this trade-off or what, what yeah, is it? Surely with the regularization, like if the new data was in a slightly different like, distribution, wouldn't the regularization be counteracting the updates? Right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, that, and that's sort of, I guess, how the, um, that's why the, 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 the way we're doing continuing learning right now, you're doing this explicit trade-off. Because the way you are interacting, forgetting, is through this regularization term that slows you down, that basically acts as a force. I mean, and um, you could try to perfectly match it. So the regularizer plays exactly the same role as the data, and then you'd learn at the same speed as if you'd done multitask learning. But that's really hard to do. So you tend to either overshoot or, or Things like that. But yeah, I mean, I guess the idea is if you change how learning works altogether and you have this kind of more compositional perspective, then yeah, that, that would be better. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, yes. uh, what is forgotten by the neural network in catastrophic, catastrophic forgetting? 
Yeah. Um, I mean, I, I think this is a, an area of research that I hope it will grow a little bit more. There, there is not that much work in this space. I mean, one thing that happens for sure, so okay, so one thing that everyone, uh, people have observed over and over again is you train on task A, train on task B, and now you evaluate on task A, you've, you've lost the performance, and then you start retraining on task A, and then you, you see that it takes you considerably less time to recover performance, right? Um, and what that means is that basically there's still some knowledge that's hidden in the representation that you haven't destroyed. What you maybe destroyed is like the output layer, like some interpretation of it. Um, but the problem is we don't know how to measure this properly. We don't know because the only thing we know is to measure performance on data points. And usually, like you kind of, when, when, when things, um, I, I haven't seen like a specific bias. It's kind of like across the board, right? You, you break things. But the fact that you can recover so quickly, it means that you haven't actually lost the representations you've learned. You've, you've lost something kind of superficial that maybe wasn't that important. Um, there is now, uh, I know of two papers, but hopefully there'll be more. There is papers now that are looking at uh, targeted forgetting. So the, 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 the usual story is you, you learn on some data and then someone comes in and say, well, you're not allowed to learn on that data point, you know, that's private or whatever. I'm taking, uh, I'm, I'm removing your, your um, freedom to learn on it. And then the question is, how do you do forgetting to target a particular data point? So you want to just remove the data point. So there are some papers in that space. I find them again, to be somewhat superficial, because what they do is they make sure that if you take the data point, you are not classifying it correctly. But that doesn't, like if you're thinking from a privacy kind of perspective, that doesn't mean that you cannot recover information about the data point, which is a different altogether, so, you know, if you're trying to recover, like what the input was, maybe you can still recover that. But it's, I just know two papers, so it's probably kind of like pro growing kind of idea of how to target forget stuff. I can, yeah, if you ping me, I can try to find them and send them. Thank you. Thank you.